And with that, I want to turn it over to Father Rick. Uh, if you have never met Father Rick, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's a professor of evangelism and leadership at Wheaton College. Uh, he had, has just uh, written the book, You Found Me, which is an excellent uh, book. Um, but importantly to me, he is my sister's godfather. Uh, and uh, I have had the privilege of knowing him literally my entire life. And uh, he's been such a significant spiritual father to me. Uh, so Father Rick, could I pray for you? Yes. yes. The Lord be with you all. And also with you. Oh, uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you have in mind for tonight. Oh, Father, thank you that you have us gathered here tonight. And we ask, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would send the Spirit of Jesus into each home where we are in, into each place where we are watching this call. And we ask that you would equip us mightily for the sake of those whom you love in this world who need to hear the good news of Jesus. So come, Spirit of God, come. Would you equip us? Would you help us? We just ask that, that because of this time that we're gathered here today, that more people would hear your good news and more people would be in the kingdom with us in the last day. We ask this for your glory, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, as... Uh... Uh, my honorary nephew said I'm Uncle Rick or Father Rick or whatever you want to call me, but I am a professor at Wheaton. I'm, I'm so excited to be uh, here tonight. He, he's right. Uh, my middle son, Stephen, and uh, William and Anne's uh, daughter, Sarah, were baptized on the same day, same night, uh, at Church of the Resurrection when it was way back in West Chicago. And uh, actually just one church that's become many churches. And uh, we were Sarah's godfather. They were uh, Stephen's godfather. And it's such a treat to have seen how God has used Nate, how God has used the, the family. And it's uh, been so fun to connect to uh, Cornerstone West Loop, but also to the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. So I'm, I'm totally jazzed about this. I just want to start by affirming you. You got out on a Thursday night uh, for, for a, an evangelism seminar. <laughs> I bet you didn't picture that that's what many of you, that that's what you would be doing. But, but, uh, but here we are. And uh, we're talking about reaching our friends during this time. And I, so I just want to, um, uh, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for all of us gathered here. And I want to thank you for your nudge to, to the folks that have come together tonight, Lord. Plant seeds, uh, do your work. Uh, Lord, we do love our friends and family. And we ask that you'll really give us practical help um, and inspire us, Lord, and give us energy in you. Uh, to make a difference in our friends' lives right now, to see you plant seeds and bring people closer to Jesus. For we pray in your name. Amen. So we're, uh, we're, we're really in a stream. Part of why a number of us have showed up tonight is that the bishop, uh, Bishop Stewart, has called us to, uh, uh, to start moving toward the heart of evangelism. Uh, many of us were present on the Easter Vigil, when he he said we're you know we're a three ply movement we we are a worship movement we're a multiplication movement that plants churches um, and and now we're going to become a movement toward the heart of evangelism so that was his his call his challenge uh, at the clergy retreat that some of us got to attend he he talked about how he thinks the diocese has been really good at helping people come back to Christ or come alive in Christ when they sort of burned out uh, on their childhood faith. And it was a, a powerful renewal for them, but we haven't been as strong as a diocese on reaching new believers, on, on discipling new believers, on reaching people that never have never known Christ. Uh, we haven't been as good a first conversion movement. And, uh, and his call to us is that we become that, uh, and uh, it's, it's been fun. I've been working with churches across the country who have that heart to, to become what we call conversion communities. Uh, churches where changed lives are the norm um, and where 10% of the attenders are new believers in the last year. Can you imagine what our churches would look like if 10% of the people attending 
were new believers in the last year. And that's the, that's the kind of vision. I, I, uh, Stuart texted me uh, just recently, Bishop Stuart, and, and uh, this is what he wrote. He, uh, he, 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 first, he referenced the book. He, he said, I continue to be stirred by your book. Our Res Elders team, Steve, Matt, Brent, and me will be reading it together over the next months. We hope we, hope we can meet with you about it. And then here's what I want you to hear. Odyssey Res and our 30 diocesan churches become conversion communities. And I know that's the cry of his heart. And that's, uh, this is kind of a, a step to, to begin to pivot that way uh, for, the, for the diocese. Uh, it, it's been so fun to watch other churches become conversion communities as we've worked with them uh, in, in other parts of the country, but I long for my church to become that and our diocese to become that. So uh, I think as we think about that, it's going to change all three strands of that. Our, our worship will still be a movement. It'll be full of praise and glory to God, a, a movement of word and sacrament infused by the Holy Spirit. But it's going to become more attuned to new believers and to people coming in. Uh, not, not that we're not, but we'll become more attuned, more hospitable. Uh, and the multiplication movement that we have, planting churches, um, it's not that that's going to change completely, but there will be a new DNA in our church planting that has a stronger tone and, uh, and note of evangelism at the heart of it. You can plant churches and, and, uh, and mainly gather believers. And I think God wants more for us than that. Uh, and so uh, we, we've had good, we know how to do it with campus-based church plants, but often not for community-based church plants. Um, and so there's a huge prayer for the release of lay evangelists. And so it's starting now, but it's funny, as we start now, right, we face this unbelievable uh, situation with the pandemic. And uh, it's, it's a challenge for us. You know, we're sheltering in place. There's a, a new normal. Uh, for lots of us, it's a different normal. Uh, for some, it's busier than it was. For some, it's uh, a furlough time. Some of us have lost jobs. There's so many different experiences we're having of the coronavirus but it's a different normal than we've ever experienced in our lifetime. And one of the realities of it is that, uh, you know, it, it's not over, gonna be over tomorrow until there's a vaccine, there'll, there'll be kind of a continuous adjustment over the next year. And probably every two to three months, there'll be kind of a new normal. And, uh, you know, People are struggling with uh, so many issues and some are lonely, some are sheltering in place alone. I, I was recently at Trader Joe's and I'm behind a woman uh, moving to the cash register. She had a great looking bottle of, uh, bottle of wine in her hand and she's excited about it. And I said, hey, that looks good. Looks like you're gonna have a little fun. And, and she said, yeah, I just wish I had somebody to share it with. And she's going home to shelter in place she said, I don't even like wine. I, I'm just hoping I run into somebody who wants to share a glass with me. And I, I didn't think at that moment, it wouldn't have been appropriate for me to, that wasn't a moment for witness, right? That wasn't a moment for me to offer, you know, oh, let's have one, no. But I prayed for her because she goes and faces a lot of loneliness. I, honestly, a lot of us are feeling Zoom fatigue, right? Are, is, is there anybody, anybody want to raise their hand and say, I'm feeling a little Zoom fatigue here. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm on this call, but man, we better get to the point quickly because I am so tired of Zoom. And I just want to say to you, if I fall asleep at all on this call, just nudge me. Oh yeah, you can't. <laughs> so, I, you know, we're social distancing, so I'll try not to fall asleep. But so that's, it's a new normal. It's a new challenge we face. 
Uh, but there's also incredible receptivity. So uh, did, did um, anybody want to make a comment on the article? Uh, I'm just going to pause for one second and let just a couple of you uh, respond to that. Unmute yourself. Did anything hit you about the article evangelism in coronavirus related to receptivity? Anything hit you there? And, and what I'm going to say about sharing is, uh, do it. No. <laughs> and not only that, but make it short and sweet. And lots of you, when I ask a question, jump in. If you think maybe you should share, do it. So anything hit you in that article? I think just the title of it is encouraging. This, uh, this is a great time, maybe the best time in our lives to share the gospel that we've ever experienced. Isn't that cool? Somebody else. Just love the idea about asking neighbors uh, how we can pray for them. Yeah. Um, Mindy kind of initiated that once you say something. Oh, gosh. I'm, well, <laughs> anyway, I just think it, I, I thought what I was struck by with the article is how much um, receptivity was tied to like kindness, acts of service, yeah. showing Christ like love. Like it was interesting how deeds sort of set the stage for people being receptive. I, that was I, what I found interesting. It, it was. The top three reasons people will uh, see a Christian's life and respond, uh, uh, be more receptive to faith, they, they, uh, they see Christians meeting real needs, doing good in the community, and having a sense of peace. You know, maybe in a time of crisis, like a, a pandemic, uh, you know, being happier because of their faith. Top three reasons. And what were the top three reasons people get more receptive in terms of life experiences? Anybody remember those? Let's see, death of a loved one, someone being sick. Yep, it was facing death, death of a loved one, loss of a loved one, and then a health crisis. So I wonder, do those have any relevance to us, you know, at, at this time? So you realize there's this incredible receptivity, but, but you also realize there's this huge barrier called social distancing, right? And the social uh, distancing means it's tougher to build new relationships, to get to the people that are in need and receptive. But I think another factor is we're, we're tired and somewhat we can be in our emotional caves, right? Our own sense of stress and fatigue may be our biggest challenge. I have a friend who, who has two kids at home, two jobs, they each have a job, they're both working from home, they're sheltering in place, they're not getting along, they're anxious about catching the virus, and in the midst of all that, they don't have a lot of extra energy to extend love or reach out to unchurched people. So, you know, in that time, who has any energy for witnessing, uh, for witness? And, but I want to ask it a different way. Uh, is there anybody out there who has energy for witness in Christ? Anybody who has a source of strength that can move us beyond that inner barrier? Anybody in the house? Could I, you know, could a few of us at least raise hands or give a thumbs up? Or, yeah, all right. Like, it's tough, but it's actually, this is the time we were made for. This is our moment. But when you look throughout history, uh, Eusebius writes about it, uh, about the plagues in the early centuries of the church. When plague hit the city, the Christians stayed, they took care of other Christians. Uh, then they took care of the, the pagans who couldn't, who couldn't escape. And when, when the plague had swept through, the Christians were left and the cities belonged to them because that was their moment. So I'm gonna interview Dan a little bit. Uh, Dan is from uh, Cornerstone West Loop. And uh, I, have, I have just a couple of questions. So Dan, if you can get off mute. Already done. 
All right, man. So Dan, what are you doing and seeing and noticing about people these days? Well, I guess one of the things I've been done doing is being deemed an essential worker. And what I do is I'm a paramedic for the Chicago Fire Department. So in people's worst moments, I'm being called on to be there for them. So, um, I guess so in terms of my schedule, my schedule hasn't really changed much being that essential worker. And a lot of the things that Rick was hinting at, you see in people. And I'd like to add to that is that there's just this sense of, and I, all of us feel it, a heaviness, a fear, anxiety in place. One of the major differences between Christians and non-Christians is our foundation is steady and secure in Jesus. This COVID coronavirus pandemic has brought this fear because almost every single thing you could put your identity in has been taken away. And that's, you know, whether that's your idea of controlling your schedule, your job security, your health, uh, how much money you have, the sports you root for or play, activities you do, all of that has been taken away. And so that has just left a huge vacuum in people's lives. What, what, what do you feel like, Dan, what have you learned that might kind of be apl applicable to this issue of witness during, during this kind of a crisis? What, what have you learned? Yeah, so also in my church, I'm a city group, a small group leader, and going and talking with other people, talking with people at work, there's two major things I want to acknowledge first, and Rick, you were already talking about is that some of us on this call have maybe have experienced huge loss. And the idea of being able to give out of myself is stings, and you kind of wonder, how can I give more? Another part of the aspect is the apathy that kind of just being at home all the time is creating, and it's in us to kind of keep going. But as I think that was wonderful what you were saying is that when we are at our weakest and we turn to Jesus, we witness a power that is beyond what we could experience without this uh, time. I think there's been challenges for me and I wanna pull up just a Bible verse that has really hit home for me this time. And it's 2 Corinthians 9 verse eight. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And Christians, we tend to create worlds where faith isn't actually necessary, that as long as I can do it, I'm okay. And this verse has been, you know, something I believed in. And until you actually have to apply it, you don't realize how short your faith actually falls. Like, it's easy to give abundantly when you have an abundant supply of toilet paper. But when you're down to your last few rolls and this verse is claiming that God is gonna to give to you, even when your toilet paper runs out, that's when you start challenging like, do I actually believe this faith? Um, and is this real for me? I think one of my mentors in college really said it takes a while for things that you know in your head to move down into your heart. And that's been a challenge for me is this is changing. Yeah, when you and I talked, you had mentioned the, you know, the thought of you, you, you gave a roll of toilet paper away to somebody and then suddenly you had the fear clutch your heart that am I going to be provided for? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was powerful for me to hear that from you. And, uh, and then, the, you know, you go out and you risk your life in a sense. You know, mm -hmm. you, there's a risk factor when you're on the front lines of taking care of people right now. And what's that done to you? Well, that's also grown a lot of trust in God. You know, all these stories throughout the Bible are all well and good to hear as kids. And hey, that's great that God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. And it's wonderful. But then these were just normal people. Everyone in the Bible were just normal people, just like you and me. And the one, just for my namesake, Daniel in the lion's den has been huge for me. And it's challenged whether I tr believe this story and will actually live it out. And there's certainly time to 
think wisely about how to engage in people's lives. Like we don't want to just be unnecessarily risking our life. Uh, I signed up on the fire department to deal with this. And I've been walking around going, you know, that God who saved Daniel in the midst of a lion's den can save me in the midst of a coronavirus. Um, until you actually have to live it, these stories are just feel good stories. And then when you live it, it goes, you realize how much harder it is, but also that God is able to provide for you as well. So it's, it's amazing how in other parts of the world, people are just used to risking life, r risking provision, uh, risking uh, their reputation uh, to witness. Um, mm -hmm. I, teach, I teach students from all over the world and, and I, uh, last summer did a, a course with a number of Chinese, uh, mainland Chinese students. And it was amazing to me to hear the risks they were uh, undergoing to preach the gospel. And, uh, and sometimes social awkwardness shuts me down. You know, I'm afraid, <laughs> oh, that's going to get a little socially awkward, you know? And these guys are like, what? <laughs> like, you're afraid of that? And I'm like, well, well yeah. And they, and they said, well, let's, let me just lay down a little bit of what I'm facing. And, and it's convicted me. And it's times like these where we have to put it on the line a little bit. So thanks a lot, Dan. I, I really appreciate your sharing and your heart, man. Definitely. Thanks. Yeah. So a few more minutes of discussion about uh, the articles that you read. Uh, you, you had the one on evangelism in the time of coronavirus or in coronavirus. And then you also had those, uh, I think it was 45 ways to love your neighbors. Was it 45? I don't have it in. I think it was like 45. What hits you from those? Jump in. Share a bit. Oh, 35, sorry, 35. Rick, just, to, just as simple as um, uh, just walking around my neighborhood and praying and um, praying for the Lord to open doors um, to share my faith. So, I mean, that was pretty simple. I did that a while ago and I kind of stopped doing it. Um, but so anyway, I want to restart with that. That, that is great, man. I, I love to hear that. You and I go back a ways, so it's fun to hear, man. Others of you, what ideas hit you? I liked really simple, practical things like uh, leaving a note in your mailbox for your mailman or, you know, leaving some cookies on the doorstep of your neighbor, something like that. Just something anybody can do. Oh, that's great. Anybody have a story they want to tell of an experience of witness that encouraged them? And just so you know, one of my rules, I often make you keep sharing until some introvert steps up to the plate and shares. On these calls often, it's only extroverts that jump in. And so one of my rules is at least one introvert has to share. <laughs> and then we I'm an introvert. <laughs> okay, well, we got our one then. So then somebody, extroverts, you can share again. <laughs> can talk uh, just to like a witnessing opportunity. Um, last week, I uh, just felt led to talk to a guy who is rollerblading in an alley. And um, I asked if, he could, if I could pray for him. He declined. But um, uh, two factors. One, just, okay, Lord, I will follow. Uh, and then just how receptive he was. Like, something that really stood out to me is how not necessarily desperate, but how much people are just willing to engage. You know, if you say hi and like be safe still, um, like this guy was not trying to get away or out of the conversation, but very much like wanting to talk and telling me all about himself. Mm -hmm. It was a really encouraging thing to experience. Uh, I love that. Thanks, Ken. Somebody else, one last story of witness. Somebody else. I know when you say last, then you feel like, well, mine's not good enough to be the last, but give it to us anyway. I'll share. My my husband and I uh, put letters in our our blocks mailboxes. Just that we were going to be praying with our church Psalm forty six every day and praying for them specifically. And met an elderly neighbor for the first time a few days after that, and she said it 
encouraged her to read that and start reading it every morning too since someone else was reading it and it was a special to me and then build a relationship oh, i love that Martin. that's great well good i uh we're I, so that's that's kind of segment one it sets up here's our context uh but but it's kind of segment one b because segment one a was uh, god's calling us as a diocese uh, to move ahead into the heart of evangelism so uh, the next thing I want to talk about then is I want to talk a little bit about relational evangelism and the Frank list. Uh, I want to introduce you. Some of you got introduced to it at Cornerstone West Loop. Uh, some of you may be at another point, but um, here's the basic idea of this section. Uh, we will have opportunities to witness to strangers, to people we run into, like the skateboarder or, uh, or like a neighbor we've never met and we put a note in their door. We will have some of those opportunities. Uh, some of the ideas that were put in, like make a pharmacy run for an elderly person or a, a grocery run. And, th and that might be somebody that we, ha we only know a little bit, an acquaintance. Um, but in times of crisis, people tend to turn to people they trust. And your most fertile, fruitful area of witness right now is people that you already have some level of trust with. And so the focus for our witness during coronavirus is really to, to do all that we can to be intentional and loving and taking opportunities to share and pray with people where we already have trust. And so tonight, we're going to sort of focus on that. We're going to drill down into that. I want to deal with just a couple of uh, questions I often get about this rela relational evangelism and the Frank list and witness. Since, since you all are on this call, you probably believe that this is something you should do and something you want to do. And, and I praise God for that, but, but I do know that evangelism, witness, can be a hard thing for us. Uh, it, it, it involves putting ourselves on the line. Um, a recent survey said millennial generation doesn't want to tell other people that they're wrong about what they believe. And so evangelism can feel risky. Uh, and so a lot of the millennial generation uh, would say, well, I don't know about sharing my faith. I, I can share that God's important to me, but I don't want to share that they need to change because that feels judgmental. And so there can be some barriers to being a witness. Some people feel like, you know, that's just not my gift. I'm not good at that. And, and so I just want to sort of address a couple of things about, about that. I wanna give just a really brief biblical uh, basis for what we're doing tonight. Uh, Matthew 4, 18 to 19 is one of them where Jesus defines what a disciple is. He goes around to the disciples and uh, you, you recall that he started with fishermen and, and, uh, and, he, and he said to them, Come, be with me, and I will make you. Can somebody finish it for me? Joel, come on, finish it for me. I will make you. A fisher of men. Fishers of men. I will make you fish for people. Right? Jesus boiled down discipleship to three really simple things. Be with him. Be like him and fish for other people who don't know him. Like at the heart of it, we, we pray and experience intimacy with Jesus, and we fellowship and help each other become like Jesus, and then we fish for other people to know Jesus. And that was Jesus' basic call to discipleship. Later on, he says, if anyone wants to come after me, uh, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Jesus is just basically saying the same thing. He's saying, stop following yourself, start following me, 
and identify with me. Take up your cross publicly. Take up your identification with Jesus. Take up and take a stand and be a witness. And you will suffer sometimes for that. That's his promise. He went to the cross for it. So all of us are, are really called to be a witness. And it's often the weakest part of our discipleship. And so that's what we're working on. You know, sometimes people will tell me, uh, uh, you know, I don't have a gift of evangelism. And if I'm, if I'm in an especially like, uh, you know, a little bit of an ornery mood, I'll say, well, I don't know, do you, do you have a gift of prayer? And I'll say, well, I mean, not really. I, and then I'll say, well, do you pray? Well, well, yeah. <laughs> well, do you have a gift of Bible study? Well, no, I don't know if it's a gift of Bible study. Yeah, but well, do you study the Bible? Well, well, yeah. So do you have a gift of evangelism? Well, no. Everybody almost, like, there's a small percentage. There's some people in West Loop Cornerstone who have that gift. But it's a small percentage. And uh, so, you know, you may not have that gift, but we are witnesses. So this is the first thing I want us to do. I want us to unmute all simultaneously. And I want us to say together, we are witnesses. Everybody unmute. And let, I'll, let, me, let me give you the exact phrase. I am a witness. One, I, two, three, I, I am, am a witness. witness. Yes. <laughs> that was a breakthrough, friends. <laughs> okay, so it'll take more than chanting it, right? But, but that's who we are. It's actually not just something we do. It's our identity. As a disciple of Jesus. I know for you. I mean, we are witnesses. I am a witness. So that's what we're going to work on tonight. And we're going to work on especially being a witness with our friends. And so that's where the Frank list come, comes in. Uh, and we're going to look at the Frank list. And, and uh, I, I'm actually going to show you mine and tell you a few stories. Cause, uh, with, with, uh, but I'm not showing you all of mine. I, I didn't put, uh, I'm not actually going to show you like what I said about each person because that's none of your business. <laughs> but, uh, but what I will do is I'll show you my friends and then I'm going to mention a couple. Uh, I'm gonna, about to tell you what a Frank list is. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm glad you asked. Somebody asked, uh, what is a Frank list? So here's, I'm going to show you what a Frank list is. A Frank list is a list of the people that are our friends, F for friends, R for relatives, a for acquaintances, N for neighbors, and C for coworkers or colleagues. And it's a really simple way to think about your spheres of influence and your network of trust. It just gives you a nice handle on where are you connected to people. Now you notice, for instance, I work at Wheaton College. So the only person of the colleague for me is my boss, Ed Stetzer, because he needs to get saved. No, I'm just, that was a joke. I'm going to show him that. Because <laughs> sometimes don't you feel that about your colleagues, <laughs> right? Even if you work at a church. But anyway, uh, so I don't have a lot of colleagues in that category because I, I'm a professor at Wheaton College. So I, I have to develop the friendships in other places. And, and a lot of pastors do. But my friends, and I, I have seven, I have more than that, but these are seven people that I'm really praying for right now. And, uh, and here's how I use the Frank list. And, and you're going to kind of see, uh, I, I, th this chart has kind of a, uh, I, I kind of ask where they're at spiritually. I'm not going to teach about that tonight. Maybe some other time we'll do that. And then I gave you the articles to talk about how do you develop a relationship during them, uh, this time with them during the season. Zoom parties, watch parties, 10 ideas list from Stetzer, 35 ways to love your neighbor. You get creative and you think of a lot of ways to build your relationship, develop your relationship. 
I know one of the things Nate has been doing is he's just texting a few people every day. At least he was when I was talking to him. People sometimes that go back in college days and high school days for him. For me, college, I maybe have one friend uh, that I'm texting because it was a little while ago. Uh, I, you know, for those of you who are young, I really am kind of Father Rick, uh, just my age, right? But, uh, but I, I have friends, you know, from every stage of life that I think about. This list will continue to get longer. Um, and, and, uh, but these are the folks I'm kind of working on right now. And so, for instance, Isa, this is going to be really fun. Isa is a friend who lives in Barcelona. And so I've decided, I'm texting him now, and we're planning a trip, my wife and I, to Barcelona next summer in Spain to spend some time with him. And my memory's been jogged because of this list, because I pray for Isa like every few days. I, I remember him, and I stay intentional, and it keeps me aware. Uh, Dave and Diane are a couple of friends who are down the block. I was praying for them the other day, and I said, man, we haven't seen them since coronavirus. We used to see them every Thursday night. So we just sent out a text to, like, get together for appetizers uh, over Zoom and, uh, and a glass of wine. So uh, Marvin, Emily, and Serena, they're in a science fiction book club. Serena came to Christ through it. Uh, and so... This, this list jogged me to sort of think about, man, I, I'm going to get us back together and get a science fiction book for us to talk about by Zoom. And it's, I picked the book, and it has some spiritual issues that are going to get us into a spiritual conversation. So I, you just start to think and you pray about, what can I do with the people I have trust with? Here are my relatives. I've got 21 of them that I'm praying about right now. Uh, you know, it's a very extended family. My dad just came to Christ like two years ago. Uh, my mom still hasn't. Uh, I have a lot of people who don't know Jesus. Some of you, all your relatives know Jesus or, or are connected to Jesus. But, and so I have a lot of work to do here. You'd expect at my age, uh, I wouldn't have so many extended friends left. Who didn't know Jesus, but but uh, I, I'm working with a different one. So just to give you just one example here, uh, uh, one of them is uh, uh, one of the family members, and uh, his job isn't working right now. So my wife and I prayed about it, and we felt we need we're working, so we need to send them a gift. And he's a person I've had incredible spiritual conversations with, and this is a next step to invest. So uh, I have acquaintances. These are people at uh, places I'm doing pick up and carry right now. Uh, neighbors. This was such a good list for me because when I thought about neighbors, I realized where I had trust and where I didn't. Um, and then uh, I had to think about how do I get intentional with them? So that's the Frank list. And I, I want to suggest, I'm trying to figure out how to stop share here. There it is. So that's the Frank list, and now I'm going to have all of you do one. And I want you to get out the, I want you to get out the uh, sheet that I sent you. Can everybody pull that up? And I, I will show it uh, to you uh, just in case. And you can just take a piece of paper and uh, jot it down on that. But we're going to fill this out for a few minutes, and then we're going to go into small groups about it. But I, I would suggest to you, here's my challenge. If you, if you heard about this in church, because we did this in our church and I talked about it for five minutes, if you did this, then expand it during this time. Because the more you expand it, the more you're able to uh, be intentional, pray for people, listen to God's spirit, let God nudge you. And... Uh, it's incredible what God could do during this time because people have needs. And, and you're the person in their life. So uh, pull that up. It, it's, uh, here's what I just want you to do is, is go. Uh, I'll share this really briefly. If you don't have it, uh, they said they're going to upload it and you'll be able to get it there. Uh, and uh, so I, I'll just show it to you on the screen. I think it's, uh, it's this one. Um, I'll do it up. 
And all I want you to do is to go to this card right here. You see this outreach temperature card? I'm gonna have you fill out the first half of it. Put your name, put the date. If you downloaded it, do a save as, and then start with friends, relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, and coworkers. And all I want you to do is put five names down right now. If you have some already, just put five more. If you, if you don't have any, just put five names down in those categories. And then I'm gonna have you do something with those names after that. Um, and then I'll, just this current outreach temperature thing, I also want you to take a quick look at that. This is not a uh, 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 precise or scientific thing. It just gives you a way to say, to do a gut check. Where am I at in my passion for witness right now? And you can see one is ice cold apathy, three and four are growing passion, five and six are growing practice, uh, seven and eight are growing uh, impact, um, and then in nine and 10, boy, you're flying, you're seeing people come to Christ, and you're also influencing others. So zero to 10, where would you put yourself on that? And what I'm gonna have you do in small groups is talk a little bit about your Frank list and a little bit about your temperature and why. So take, take a few minutes now before we put you in small groups, uh, work on that. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them but spend a little bit of time working on that. I should have asked for the violin player now, so I'll hum for you. Does that work? I have a terrible voice, so. <laughs> if you're able to do some violin, we'd all love it. <laughs> Be thou my, no. <laughs> Hannah asked where we can get the sheets. And uh, I think uh, it was put up, uh, it's on the chat, Hannah, and you can download it and then you can make copies. Well, we're gonna go into small groups now. We'll be there for about 10 minutes. Uh, you should all have small group leaders and uh, start talking about what God's doing, uh, the seeds God's planting, and how he might want to use you in the lives of your friends and family. Welcome back. I hope that you, uh, I hope you enjoyed that sharing. I, uh, uh, you know, it's always a great, a great thing. One of the, one of the things that I've discovered about witness is we often don't get encouragement or accountability in that area. Uh, we, we, we pray about a lot of other things. Sometimes we keep each other uh, accountable. Uh, I mean, yeah, in areas of Bible study or in areas of sin in our lives. 
Um, but often in this area of witness, we, we don't ask each other the, the hard question that ends up being really the encouraging question, uh, which is, how do I help you do what you want to do? How can I encourage you? How can I pray for you? Uh, how can I uh, encourage you as you try to reach out to friends, family members, try to bless them and all of that? So one of the lessons I hope you could think about, like even that conversation, you can see what happens when you just have a conversation about it. It makes you think about stuff. And, and you know, if you're discouraged and then you say it, it helps you get beyond it because you've been able to say it out loud. Uh, man, I'm tired. My temperature's gone down. And, and when you say it, then you begin to be able to deal with it and pray for each other on it. So, so I, I, one of the hopes from our time tonight is that you think about ways regularly. One of the things we teach in our cohorts is every 30 days at a minimum, we need an infusion of help in the area of witness or else mission drift sets in. And we just, uh, we lose our intentionality, we, we lose our way. So, uh, so think about that, think about who you might pray with about this area. And I wanna talk a little bit then about the second piece of what we can really deeply do during BLESS. I mean, during coronavirus. <laughs> and uh, what we can really do is we can bless others. And uh, some of you, I, I wish there were a way I could see it, lots of hands, because I would ask, uh, ask you how many of you have heard about this and have been using uh, BLESS in your life and in your church. But um, it, it's, it's an idea. It actually initially came out of uh, church, uh, Community Christian Church. Uh, some of you know Dave Ferguson, and I was actually at that church for a while and helping that church grow and bless. That was part of my work at, the, at that church. They just uh, engaged me for a while to help them with these blessed practices as a church. And, but one of the things I always felt like is that's such a good name for an Anglican way of evangelism blessing others. Like, after all, we have priests, and we understand blessing, and we understand the priesthood of all believers, and we of all people, like Anglicans, ought to be world-class at blessing others. And uh, we have this opportunity, I think, in witness to reframe what it is. Some of us think about evangelism as standing on a street corner, and praise God, those of us who have the boldness to do it, and see God use that, but a lot of us, if that's our view of it, we just won't ever engage. And so many of us need a, a paradigm shift in evangelism that's not quite so invasive or, or quite so extroverted or quite so sales-like for some of us. We need a little bit of a different paradigm. And that's what this blessed paradigm of evangelism can be. It's based on Genesis 12, 1 to 3, where God says to uh, Abraham, I'm choosing you. I will bless you. Uh, those who curse you, I will curse. Those who bless you, I will bless. And through you, I will bless all the nations of the earth. I almost feel like I, we could have said that together, you know, in unison. Because God's mission is a blessing mission. He wants to bless every nation on earth and every person on earth in such a way that they know they're loved by God. And that they can repent of their sin and return to God and follow God through Jesus, follow Jesus. And God wants to bless the whole world with that message, but also he wants to bless the whole world in concrete actions that show that God really loves them. So God's mission is a blessed mission. Uh, I uh, don't have time to tell you the whole story, uh, but... There was a study done of a Thai, uh, Thai mission group, actually 12 of them, uh, in Thailand. And they were 12 different businesses mission groups. And six of them started a business mainly so they could preach the gospel and convert people. And six of them started businesses so that they could bless people with economic, you know, money, jobs, uh, relationships, uh, local economies. And they also wanted them to accept Christ. They had an intention about that, but they were there to start businesses. And uh, just really, I wish I could tell you more of the story, but really briefly, 
uh, the converters and the blessers, that's what he called them. The converters started business mainly just to preach the gospel and convert people. The blessers started a business mainly to start a business and bless the economy and hire Thai people. And uh, the blessers did more social good. They started better social business. They started better businesses. What was surprising is the blessers also converted more people. And what was shocking is the ratio. The ratio was 48 to one. Two people came to Christ over a three year period from the converters and 96 people came to Christ through the blessers. Now both cared about the gospel, but the blessers also showed the love of God and shared the love of God. And when you get that combination, people really responded. So what are the blessed practices? They're, does anybody know them? Anybody uh, uh, know the blessed practices and can rattle them off? Oh, Begin somebody's going to gonna read them. That's good. <laughs> yeah, Zach, you know them. Go ahead. Begin with prayer. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Eat. Yeah. Serve. People. Yeah. Share. Share. Share our story. Yep. So begin with prayer. Listen. And it's on your sheet. <laughs> That's why any of you could have shouted them up anyway. Begin with prayer. <laughs> but way to, way to go, Joel and Zach, uh, to, to catch that. <laughs> Begin with prayer. And I know you guys have been using it. Listen, eat, serve, and story. So B, begin with prayer. Pray for people who don't know Jesus. Pray with people who don't know Jesus. Listen. Ask them about their life and their spiritual story eat. You got to do that virtually now. It's still pretty fun. I love eating. I don't know about you. I love eating. Uh, that's, that's the basis of half my relationships with people, unchurched people right now, is we love to get together and eat, and so now we're doing it virtually. Uh, serve. And here the key question is, how will the people around you in your life, in your family, how will they feel loved? Think about their language of love. The people in your life, how will they feel loved? Is it a note? Is it a gift? Is it affirmation? But whenever we like love people well, is it just quality time? That's listening. Uh, don't do the touch thing. That's the fifth language of love. Some of you know the five languages of love. You can do that with your partner, whoever you're sheltering in place. But right now, that one's not going to work. But the other four languages of love do. How can we serve people so that they feel loved? Uh, my, my dad is so cool. I tried to love him. He came to Christ a couple years ago, and he's now doing that with his friends. He's actually working now to renew his whole church. I, I've been, he read my book. He got my pastor of my book. Now he's been asking for resources. He's feeding his pastor these resources, and they're trying to, like, turn a whole church around uh, to reach out. And I just love what he's doing, and he's been practicing this. And uh, I just have to read. I, I tried to encourage him. Uh, but uh, he just, he recently just wrote me a, uh, he wrote me a text and uh, just expressed a love for me well. And I, I just have to, I don't know, this will be more meaningful to me than to you, I know. But here's the text he sent me. And this is the kind of text we need to be writing to people. My dad wrote, and, and I need to tell you, my dad's not a guy who expresses love very well. Uh, he didn't hear that he was loved until he was 21. That's the first time somebody told him that they loved him. And, and he wrote me this text. He said, as I grow older, I don't typically spend much time regretting the things I can no longer do. Today was quite beautiful, and I took an early morning walk. On the way back, I really wished I could pick up my canoe and my five-year-old son 
and go fishing on twin ponds. Big heart. So my dad like took time to just tell me he loved me and he doesn't like he's not good at saying that. I, I have never seen my dad use a heart on a text in my life. And he used this big red heart to say that he loved me. And that I was his five-year-old son. That's one of my favorite memories when I was young. We went out on a canoe. I, I was carrying it, I thought, you know, the very back of it. He was actually carrying it. And if he'd let it down a little bit, I'd have been wiped out. But I, we, we fished. I caught more fish than he did. It's the first time that happened and the last because he, he, he let me. <laughs> he, he took all my fish off and put all my worms on. But that said, he loved me. And that's the question we want to be asking during this time. See, so many of us during coronavirus have kind of empty tanks. A lot of us do on this call. And, and we don't have a lot there. And somehow, though, this is our moment because nobody does. And we can ask Jesus to fill our tank enough to be able to let that spill over a little in acts of real love to, to other people. Hey, listen, here's a, also an intriguing thought about serving people. Sometimes when you ask for their help or their prayer, that's the most powerful way you can love them. And I regularly ask my unchurched friends to pray for me. And sometimes that's more powerful, much more powerful than when I offer to pray for them. Because when I offer to pray for them, it's like, oh, you're really hurting. I'm the spiritual guy. I'll pray for you. I mean, I do offer to pray for lots of people. Don't get me wrong. I want you to do that. But I often find it's even more powerful when I ask them to pray for me. I have a lot of unchurched friends who pray for me. And I think God hears their prayers. Sometimes more than he hears the prayers of my Christian friends. Because God like, is very powerfully at work to want to show them that he's alive. So, uh, and, then, and then story, telling our story. You saw a lot of different things we could do there, uh, sharing our story, so uh, sharing Jesus' story. So here's what I want you to do. Get that worksheet out again. And uh, I want you to take that, take your friend, you know, take that bottom thing Put those five names of the friends that you have. And then what's your next step to bless them? What are you concrete? And pray about this. It's not just making it up or having it come out of your activism. It's asking God, how can I love them best next? How can I bless them? So take a few minutes to do that. And then we'll go back into small groups and we'll pray for our friends and we'll pray for our blessed list. And, uh, and then when I come back, I'm going to show you the next stage of what I do with this. Uh, and for some of you, that's what you've been waiting all call for, and you'll get a couple minutes on it. But anyway, do, uh, do your uh, bless list now. What are your bless actions for your Frank folks? It's on the same card that you listed your Frank.
Okay, we're gonna head into small groups and uh, and basically uh, what I want you to do, let me get rid of this, because uh, I, I noticed that some didn't, uh, uh, some, you, you might not have known exactly what to do. So let me tell you exactly what to do for with the questions. Um, basically, you're going into small groups and you wanna have each person share their next steps, how you would like prayer, and then be prayed for and you have, and you have 10 minutes and uh and then at, at the end you might want to ask if anybody has any ideas about providing positive support and accountability from here we'll come back in 10 minutes and i'll show you what next you could do and we'll go from there uh just just a couple final things it's been fun i, was, I got to be in a couple of different groups and uh, both a city group and then also uh, the res group. And uh, uh, I, I love hearing stories. Lots of folks uh, feel that sense of um, uh, lethargy or it's, it's, there's a, mo a momentum to stay at home that makes it hard to get out of ourselves and to, and to reach out. And uh, so one of the things we talked about on our talk is just one little step can make a big difference. Uh, not trying to be grandiose or having some big plan, but one little step of outreach. And I know one person on our call talked about just trying to connect with one person a day. And uh, and both Christians and unchurched, like uh, in a week's time, that would include both Christians and unchurched people. Uh, but just having that kind of conversation uh, and, and having that kind of a goal. Uh, I, I, other people had a goal uh, that they want to do this week. And I just I love seeing people come up with a doable step and small steps make a huge difference uh, when it comes to, to witness. And uh, so uh, I think uh, part of where we go from here, I don't know if Nate will want to say something. I, uh, you know, we, we had a song in my day. Uh, it was actually a wedding song, but it fits what we're talking about. It was Karen Carpenter, the Carpenters. And uh, the song was, we've only just begun. And I, you know, Nate, are you going to mute me if I start to sing it? <laughs> not, not this time. Okay, we, we've we only just begun to live. Uh, and then it goes on white lace and promises, but, but we're really about bringing people together in a, in a marriage relationship, in a lordship relationship with Jesus. And as a diocese, we're starting on a journey uh, that Bishop Stewart has called us to. Part of what I love about Nate and Nate's heart is he spent a lot of his college years, he went to a secular university and he reached out and he learned about reaching out and that's part of the DNA of our church. But, but uh, I really believe God wants many of our churches uh, to become conversion communities. Uh, we're changed lives of the norm and new believers are consistently a, a significant percentage of our con congregations. And in, a, in, an, in an amazing way, little steps are what get us there. But we had a church that just started working with 28 of their leaders just to do Frank and Bless regularly and check up on each other once a month. And in one year, they re, none of them led anybody to Christ. And then the next year, doing Frank and Bless for, for the first time and checking in on each other every 30 days, 16 of uh, 16 of those 28 leaders led 64 people to Christ. And I'm not saying that's what will happen in all of our churches. All I'm saying is little steps have a huge impact. God gets really happy when we like take the little step we can um, and, and trust Jesus with it. So I think, you know, where we go from here, I encourage you to find a way to check in with somebody about witness uh, every 30 days and encourage each other more often if you want and to pray for each other about that. And I encourage you to follow up on the Frank and Blessed list. And those of you who are rectors or pastors or lead leadership teams, have a time every 30 days, at least, with your leadership teams that you check in about this, frank and bless. So it's easy things to remember, you know? Uh, and, and, uh, and as you check in, people actually get encouraged enough 
to like take a step and, and be a witness. And, uh, and then I think, you know, I hope we have a cohort in our diocese. Uh, Aaron Damiani have been, and I have been talking about this for like two years, right Aaron? Is Aaron, I know he was on this call. Um, I don't know if you had to step off at all. Yeah, but. I'm here and totally, I'm. Right, man. We've been talking about this for two years, right? Yeah, yeah, we've been trying. I, I remember we talked about it first at the Gospel in Our Cities conference. Exactly. We ran into each other there and, and you said, man, because we've been doing cohorts for eight years. Actually, Father Stewart was in the first one, Bishop Stewart. Um, and Aaron found me there and said, man, I want that. I need that encouragement and prayer. And, and man, if you got tools like this that I can keep on learning from and passing on to my people, it could really make a difference. And Aaron said, you know, that's not because I'm a big evangelist. I need help in this area. And I just love your heart, Aaron. And, and so, I, you know, I'm hoping that God really raises that up in our diocese and we go on a journey together where we encourage each other and pray for each other and see God do a miracle to just pour out his spirit and make us a movement of worship, multiplication, and evangelism. Amen? Amen. So from follow up ahead, Nate, uh, say what you want and send us off, man. Yes, thank you, Father Rick. Let him a little Zoom clap for leading us tonight. <laughs> oh, we have to be generous with our Zoom claps. <laughs> that... Thanks. You know, I think it's possible. Got, now I'm back. <laughs> yep. I have, I have a feeling I got frozen there. Well, I, I did, I think. But yeah, maybe no. we all did. Yeah, I, I think it's my internet that is unstable. I have a feeling that we're going to look back on this night and remember that through just a very quickly put together Zoom call that we gather as a diocese in just kind of a on the ground way that we're gonna see this as a night when God actually started something and bringing us together to commit to evangelism and to what God is going to do. And so I just look forward to looking back at this night and remembering and seeing all the people who came to know the Lord through this. So I don't know if you heard, uh, I have your emails. If you, uh, I'll, I'll share some next steps with you on things that we can do together as a diocese. Um, and more trainings that Father Rick and others can be involved in. If you don't want to receive those emails, you can directly message me in the chat or uh, you can uh, just tell me the first time you get one. Um, but let me send us out with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he fill you with peace. And Father, I pray that you would fill each of your servants with the peace of your Holy Spirit that fills them with a desire to share that peace. I ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.